tonight I have asked three college representatives here. First, we're going to have the program talk about the college admissions process. So I asked them each to talk about the different parts of the process and one person will be talking about it and then they'll be adding in anything that they um, want to add according to their institution or um, if they wanted to add something that they think you should know. And then at the end, they will each be talking about their specific institution and what they are looking for and specific programs that they have and they might have different admissions requirements for that. I do want to just go through the packet that was handed out. So we have the agenda and then if you could by the end of the program fill out the evaluation form. On each table there's a sign-in sheet. If you could sign in um, and put uh, the parent name and then who your junior is or your child is and um, and then if we could also have you um, if you're in AVID check off if you're AVID. If you're just here without a parent just put your name under child and then uh, so if you can do the evaluation form um, this will help us to improve our program um, going forward and then we have uh, a handout about the junior year navigating the college search process and on the back of it um, some resources which I did email out but um, here it is again and then UMass uh, Graduate School of Nursing is having an expo on Monday April 8th and this gives information about that and how to register and we also have uh, an early college planning uh, early college program that started this fall and so we have summer session one and two courses available uh, at Quins Quinsigamond Community College has a summer session one and two and on the back of it is summer session one at Worcester State. If uh, your child is interested in that please have them come see me about that um, in the guidance office. At the end, I am going to go over um, our website, the, call, um, the guidance website on, um, it's part of the Doherty website and there we have a college handbook um, that uh, you can download that has a lot of good information on it. The courses that are available for next year under each, uh, uh, for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So um, there's a Word document that you can download on that. And um, in the next month to six weeks, we're going to be seeing your child in their English classes uh, to do course selection. But I'll go over that in, at the very end. So without further ado, I'm going to ask, we're going to have Tiana Carasquillo, from Worcester State talk about uh, the transcript and the SAT, ACT scores. Thank you. Hi, good evening everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, before I get started, I always like to let families know um, that we are all here as a, the professionals um, in the field. So if for any of you this is the first time you have a student going off to college, it's going to be okay. Um, you know, take some deep breaths and, um, you know, definitely ask questions. Uh, we might be talking about terms and concepts that might be new to you, and that's okay again. Feel free to stop us and, and, and have us elaborate on that. Um, I've been in this field for over 10 years, and I could say that all of my colleagues are absolutely wonderful, friendly people. So I just wanted to say that, that we're here um, really to, to help you through this process. So in terms of the, uh, the transcript, when uh, colleges are looking at your high school transcript, really our main goal is to see if you are ready for college work. Um, you know, most uh, high schools uh, hopefully offer a college prep curriculum, um, and that curriculum does prepare you for, for college. Um, many high schools have different levels. You know, after college prep, you have honors courses, then you have AP courses, um, those different levels, uh, de increase in difficulty in terms of work um, expectations and things like that. Um, dual enrollment courses, if anyone's ever heard of that before, a dual enrollment course 
is typically a course a high school student takes as um, at, a, at a college. So they're taking, sorry, a college credit course as a high school student. Um, so I know at Worcester State University, we do offer dual enrollment courses, which I've actually seen a couple of you in here that have taken a Worcester State uh, dual enrollment course. Many of the juniors or even seniors may take advantage of a dual enrollment course. Um, and if you have, I'll, I'll be here after if you have, want more information about dual enrollment. So when colleges are looking at your transcript, they like to see a college prep curriculum, uh, taking honors and AP courses and challenging yourself to take a more difficult uh, class will just show that you are willing to do more work, that you're more prepared for college. And so it's something that is a really good thing if you can take honors courses or AP courses or even a dual enrollment course. Um, with that said, we want you to do well. Um, so if you um, are you know, strong in, in the college prep curriculum course and honors courses and you don't want to take an AP, it's something that you don't have to do, but it's, it's something that if you want to, you definitely challenge yourself to do that. Um, I encourage everyone here to make a list of all the colleges they want to apply to. So for example, if you're applying to UMass, Worcester State, and WPI, um, you're going to want to keep a list and maybe keep a folder, whether that's an electronic folder or a paper folder, because every single school has different criteria in terms of what they're looking for on the college transcript, different criteria for maybe GPA requirements. Um, so what I tell you what the Worcester State requirements are for uh, our, what we're looking for might be very different from WPI and very different from UMass. So you're going to have to take lots of notes, um, and that is my recommendation to, to stay organized, is to make a list. And as you're asking these questions, um, you're going to want to you know, write them down. You know, so for Worcester State, for example, our average accepted student has about a B to B plus. That's about a 3.0 to 3.2. Um, our range is maybe even a 2.6 through a 4.0 and higher. Um, again, that can be very different for these two schools that are right next to me in terms of what we're looking for, so just write that down. Um, in terms of GPA, your high school transcript might have what's called a weighted GPA or an unweighted GPA. If you have a weighted GPA, really what that means is that if you are taking more challenging courses like honors and AP courses, those have what's called like a more, a, more weight or you get more points for taking a more challenging uh, course. So that's really what that means. So I, Doherty, they do have a weighted and unweighted. So you'll notice that if you are in honors and AP courses, your weighted GPA might be a little higher. Um, so that's the, just what, what those two terms mean. Um, some schools don't have weighted and unweighted. So every school across the United States have very different ways of um, using their GPA scales, um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, I also want to let you know that some colleges and universities will recalculate a GPA. Has anyone ever heard of that before? A recalculation. So your high school transcript might have, for example, a 3.2 listed as your GPA. Um, I know for Worcester State and the state schools, UMass, we recalculate. WPI does not recalculate. Again, so this is where I'm telling you need to make, take these notes. Uh, what that means is that the state schools, we are going to take all your courses in the core curriculum. So these are like your English, math, history, uh, those core academic courses. And we're going to put them into a calculator and come up with our own GPA. Um, we are taking out classes like gym class or career explorations or some of those other classes that are not academic courses. And so that could affect your GPA in terms of um, what it might be at, we're calculating it at Worcester State versus what Doherty High School is calculating it. That's just more of an FYI. I might be giving too much detail, but I wanted to let you know that that does happen at some schools. Um, and then the last thing, in terms of how do colleges review your transcript for certain majors. Again, you're going to have to ask this question. Uh, certain majors might have different criteria. So for example, maybe uh, WPI only because I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy to share that at WPI, our review of the transcript will probably look very different from that of a liberal arts institution. 
a liberal arts institution is going to look equally at your performance in English and the foreign languages as science, as mathematics. A school like WPI, which has a focus on the STEM programs, is probably going to pay closer attention to your math performance and your lab science performance. And maybe we care a little less about your foreign language performance. We tend to see that the grade performance corresponds with that, meaning the students who apply to WPI typically are challenging themselves in math and science disciplines. They want to take that AP Calculus course, or they want to try that Honors Physics course, but maybe they're not as excited to take AP Latin or Honors French, as an example. So Worcester State, we don't have any uh, course specific course requirements, only because I know uh, WPI, you do require a minimum of pre-calculus. That's correct. Um, for Worcester State, our minimum math requirement is Algebra 2. So again, this is just about asking questions when you're talking to admissions counselors. What are uh, the GPA requirements you're looking for, the range? Uh, are there any courses that are required to apply to a particular major? Are there any courses required to apply to a particular college? Again, just an example, Worcester State, I gave you our average accepted student, but that does not apply to uh, our nursing major. Our nursing major has different GPA requirements, um, which are uh, much higher, um, and they're reviewed a little bit differently. So I we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about nursing requirements later. The last thing I'll talk about, uh, SAT or ACT scores. I will say that many colleges are going test optional or moving away from using SATs as a way to evaluate a student. Um, Worcester State, we are test optional. Uh, that means that you do not have to submit SAT scores if you do not want to for all majors except for nursing and occupational studies. Um, the high school transcript is a better indicator. Well, sorry. Oh. The high school transcript. You who could still hear me? Yeah. The Maybe if you can hear. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay, so S oh, there we go. So SAT scores. Um, I will say there's been a lot of research that has shown that the high school transcript in your GPA is a better indicator of college success, more so than SAT scores. So a lot of colleges across the state and even the country uh, are moving towards an SAT optional. Uh, route, meaning that you do not have to submit SAT scores if you do not want to. However, this is a question you have to ask the college. Uh, so Worcester State, we are SAT optional, except for, all, except for nursing and occupational studies majors. Um, schools have average SAT ranges or maybe SAT minimums that they are looking for for a student. Again, you have to ask the, the colleges and universities what those are. Um, the Worcester State average accepted student probably has about a 1050 combined score. But again, we have a range anywhere from 1,000 through 1,200, uh, give or take, so to give you an idea there. Um, and the last point here, scores for specialized programs, I think I touched about that. You'll have to ask, um, our nursing program has separate SAT scores and GPA requirements and compared to all other majors uh, at Worcester State. So I'll just leave that there. Thank you. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Common Application. The Common Application is a tool that is used by hundreds of colleges. There are other applications that you may fill out. Uh, there are institution or college specific applications. There's something called the Coalition Application. And then there's the most common one called the Common Application. So this opens on August 1st. So going into your senior year, you are welcome to create an account and you can begin filling in all the many, many fields that are required to complete this application. It's essentially a shared database of information. You're gonna put information about where you live, your parents, the activities that you are involved in. Um, you will write an essay, and that information can be sent to any one of hundreds of schools that participate or who are common application member schools. This is the chance of the application for you to speak on your own behalf. So many of the other elements of the application we're getting from the school directly, 
You're going to hear later from Jasmine about recommendations. So we're going to hear from other people about you. But this is your chance to take ownership of the process and talk directly to the admissions counselors who are reading your file. So for example, there's a section in the common application that's called additional information. This is the catch-all paragraph where you can basically tell the admissions professional anything you want them to know. I've read things that say, oh, I want to bring to your attention uh, my decision to, to move you know, from this program to this program in my school. Or I want to let you know that I suffered from mono in my sophomore year. And if you see a dip in my grade second quarter of sophomore year, that's why. We see all sorts of things listed in that common application. Again, it's a chance for you to speak on your own behalf. I will say that when it comes to uh, the essay, the essay is a requirement for, I would say most schools you're looking at are going to have a required essay. There may be some that do not. The common application will require an essay from you. And there are specific prompts, meaning they will give you a question for you to answer. And you can select from one, I think it's one out of seven different options available to you. Pick the one that feels comfortable and you should spend some time, uh, if you can, you should spend some time writing a draft, talking to your parents, your friends, your teachers. Um, have someone else read your essay and give you some feedback. They can reflect on what you've written. And again, take a chance to edit it, proofread it. Um, you would be amazed at what you can catch when you proofread your own work. My other tip is please do not do this on your phone because the formatting comes out horrifically when it gets to the, the person actually reading your application. So while you might choose to do a draft on your phone, um, be really careful when you import that into the, into the tool so that it looks like an actual essay and not one giant paragraph of 300 words. And my last tip with regard to the essay is to be authentic. This is your voice, not your parents' voice, not your neighbor's voice, not your older sister's essay. This is your opportunity to speak on your own behalf. Choose a topic that speaks to your soul. What's, what are you passionate about? Because the more interested or passionate you are in the topic, that's going to come through when we read the essay. We're learning more about you. You may be telling us about a community service trip that you took. You may be telling us about an activity. You may be telling us about an experience. But in that storytelling, we're learning more about you. And remember that colleges are looking not only to fill their classrooms, but these are residential communities. We're looking for students who are going to contribute to the whole campus community. So we're looking for artists and athletes and thespians. We're looking for people who are, who are actively involved in their school and community, and they want to continue that at college, because it makes for a richer, more robust college community. So you will have opportunities to upload a resume, or, any, or you can identify individual activities on that common application. These could be clubs. These could be service opportunities. It could be employment opportunities. And it also can be commitments that you have within the home. So for those of you who might not have the opportunity to take advantage of a lot of after school activities because you've got two younger, two younger siblings you need to be home for every day, write that down in your application. That's important for the admissions counselor to know. We want to know what makes you tick. What do you do in your non-school time? Um, that's important to us because, again, we're looking to get a picture of the whole student which informs this thing called holistic admissions. The concept of holistic admissions is that you are more than the sum of your GPA and your scores and your courses. You are so much more than that. And that's one way to get at that is by looking at your resume and by reading that essay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine Rosario from UMass Amherst. I'm going to be talking to you about supporting documents and letters of recommendation and such. Um, so all of those sections that we talked about up until now are things that you're telling me about yourself. How are you doing in your classes? How did you do on your testing? Um, your essay is going to be your personal voice. The transcript, um, the recommendations, however, are going to be about people speaking on your behalf and saying all the great things about you. So it's really important to 
at least now think about who you want to be asking for recommendations um, because you want someone who can go into detail and brag about you and tell us all of the wonderful things that we need to know that you might not tell us yourself in your essay um, or that you might not elaborate on in a resume or a list of activities because you're kind of just putting it down um, bulleted. So think about the teachers, that, the classes that you did really well in or the professors that maybe you didn't, you struggled in those classes but you worked with them one-on-one -on -one to improve a grade. People who can speak about you. So if you had one professor, you know, your, or a teacher, I should say, your freshman year of high school and you haven't seen them ever since and now junior year is coming around, they may not be the best person to ask for uh, a letter of recommendation because they have to kind of dig back and think about, do I remember this student? Think, um, and so the same thing with counselor recommendations. Um, your counselors are going to submit a recommendation that's kind of like a general overview of what you've done in your academic um, career here. They're going to give highlights of your four years, and then your teachers are going to talk about the specifics of your, um, your academic performances in specific classes. So for UMass Amherst, we don't have um, specific requirements of you need one math teacher or one English teacher and so on. We want to have at least one letter of recommendation for you on file, but um, the more that you can submit, the better. We ask that students don't submit more than four. That's just for our personal um, sanity. We have over 45,000 applications that come through, so it would be a lot to do times four. Um, but up to three is um, our maximum. And we want to have a range. So a math teacher and an English teacher and a counselor is going to give us this overall view, overview of how you're doing in your ac academic performances. Um, if you're considering perhaps ac um, competitive majors or specific majors, such as STEM, WPI, or for us, some of our competitive majors, engineering, for example, it would be helpful to hear what a science or math teacher is going to be saying, because that's the, the subjects that you're going to be taking at our school. Um, but basically, my main tip would be pick somebody who can really speak well about you because we look at those in detail. Um, some schools offer interviews, so uh, if they can, they will make an appointment with you and you can go in and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an admissions counselor and they will keep that information in their file and use that as part of their admission decision. Um, I know for University of Massachusetts, we don't, we don't have um, the capacity to interview everyone. So we are happy to meet with families and students for general information purposes to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And it definitely helps with you getting more familiarized with the programs that we have and our admission requirements and standards. Um, but we don't commit, conduct formal interviews. So like Tiana was saying, when you're going up to different schools at college fairs or you're calling and asking about information, find out if that's part of the process. Um, and then all schools are going to offer you college visits, and that's really key. Um, you may be looking online and seeing all the different majors that schools offer and think, oh, I want to apply to this school because it has our program. And then you go visit the school and realize that maybe it's not what you thought. Or maybe you wrote off a school because it didn't have something you wanted and you visited by chance and loved it. So it's very helpful to sign up for tours, information sessions, and just go to the campus and see can I see myself in this location in the, in the fall? Um, oh, for um, a lot of students who come to, to UMass for a tour, they will tell us, at first, I was really overwhelmed by the size. I thought this was going to be too big. But now that I've gone on tour, I realize that this is something that I can manage. So we love to have students come and so that we can show them all the things that we have on our campus. You can try out their dining. You can um, make appointments with specific departments while you're on campus to talk to them about their specific programs. So this is a great way for you to start narrowing down your list. If you have a list of 50 schools, I always encourage student, students, yeah, they do that nowadays. Students are applying to so many schools. And in Common App, you can kind of just select so many. You don't realize you're applying to so many. Um, but if you have a list that long, or even if it's shorter, earlier you want to start going maybe over the summer and kind of just walking around and seeing what that campus is like to narrow down your options, then when you have that final list of schools that you think that you want to apply to, visit them. Um, we, for us, we have them every single day, multiple times a day, and then there are also weekend options, and then there are also formal options like open houses that we conduct. So there's endless opportunities for you to visit any of those campuses. 
so super helpful. Um, <clears throat> many families and students don't know this, that uh, colleges will track whether you visit them or not. It's called a demonstrated interest. Um, and I think it's a helpful a tip that, um, you know, if a student applies, you know, Jen Clue had applied to Worcester State, I could actually look up her file and see if she attended open house, went for a campus tour. And sometimes that could help your application having a visit. Um, sometimes colleges will offer a, a free application fee waiver um, if you visit campus, you know, if you attend the open house. Anyone who attends, you can get to have your $50 application fee waived. So um, that's another benefit uh, to visiting a college, not only because you want to see if you, it's, it's a good place for you, if this is a good fit for you, um, but also from the admission size, it, it could definitely help um, in, in addition to doing like a, a, a campus interview. Um, and so what do you want to add to those, that list that you're making or that folder that you're making for all the different schools and colleges are deadlines. Every school is going to have different deadlines. So here um, they've listed early action and early decision. Those are two different admission deadlines. Um, early action is essentially just an early application deadline. It's just an opportunity to get your information to us sooner than later. Um, typically, if you're applying early action, your senior year, um, yeah, your first quarter senior year grades are not available yet. Um, and so if you're applying early action, you are confident that the grades that you have your first three years are going to be similar to what you have your senior year, and you are comfortable with us making a decision with just three years of grades. Um, early decision is a binding agreement. So essentially, if you are applying to a school that has an early decision deadline and you get into that school, you have made a commitment to attend that school. Okay? And so if you're it, admitted into the early decision school, you then contact all the other schools that you've applied to and withdraw your application. Um, or if you have a decision, you decline it however you want and you are required to go. Unless there is a financial circumstance that makes it really impossible for you to attend that school, that's usually the only time that they would allow for that process to happen. So early action is not binding, it's just an early, just earlier application deadline. And then there's regular decision, which is the regular decision deadline. It's not early. Um, every school is different. For us, it's in January. I think for um, Worcester, it's in March. Oh, and you have rolling. So regular decision um, depends on the school. And then rolling admissions is essentially nonstop. Um, it's not unlimited. You have to, I think they'll take applications up to when school starts, you cannot keep applying once the semester has begun, or else you're gonna be missing classes, but it goes really late into the admission cycle. Um, so you have plenty of time to do it that way. Most of the community colleges are rolling. So there's not a hard and fast deadline um, that way. And then, as you know, Worcester does, and some of the other schools have a rolling admission decision. So for UMass Amherst, we have early action and regular. We don't have early decision, there's nothing binding, and we're not rolling, and we're done right now with our, our reading. Um, but early action for us is in November, and early um, and regular decision is in January. So I like to think that if you're getting all your stuff in in December, before the holiday season, it's always helpful to get all that stuff out of the way so that you don't have to worry about it afterwards. Um, and if it's earlier, then definitely make sure to get that in sooner than later. Yeah. So the proliferation of early plans, uh, colleges have been adding um, early action and early decision options uh, at a fast rate in the last decade. And part of this is, is uh, self-serving for the university because we'd like to know who's in our class earlier. Um, but it's also important for the students because as Jasmine just allude, uh, alluded to, if you know where you're going to college, you can take it a little bit easier maybe in terms of some of the other things that your peers are going through uh, through the rest of the winter and the spring. We believe at WPI we have early action, not early decision, and by elongating the decision-making time frame, it really makes the student feel that much better about where they ultimately decide to enroll. This is a major life decision. And there are major financial consequences. And we think that if we have longer to have those conversations, you will feel better about where you ultimately pay that deposit on May 1st. Whereas if you apply regular decision, the college may not be communicating with you until no, nearly April. 
and then you have the month of April to get it all figured out, which can really be uh, stressful. The only other thing I'll note here is it's important to ask the colleges, if you're applying to selective colleges and universities, there can be a very large disparity between the admit rate for an early program versus the admit rate for a regular decision program, meaning it may be easier to gain entrance to the university if you choose an early option. Um, so that's just something to consider because I have seen that at a lot of institutions. And then our favorite topic is financial aid. Um, so is everyone familiar with the FAFSA? Have you heard of that acronym, Free Application for Federal Student Aid? So it's a free application. You can find it at fafsa.gov. If you are at a website that is asking you for a payment, you're at the wrong site. Um, so it's a free form. You fill out um, parents and students together, fill out this form with as much information as possible. It includes personal information, um, as far, you know, birth date, address, all of that, and then it's also going to include household income information. And this is the form that we use to essentially create a calculation to determine how much money we can give you all in loans, grants, and any additional funding that we may have. So the financial aid process for us is separate from the way that we award scholarships. So financial aid is a need base. It's based on you know, your family income and um, the cost of attendance at the particular school. And then you may also receive additional funding um, if it's merit-based, um, if you have great academic performance and fall within the, admission, or the, the scholarship requirements for that particular school. And every school, again, is different for what they're looking for to offer scholarship awards. Um, through the FAFSA, you're going to get loans. That's primarily the largest amount of funding that they'll give you through the FAFSA. You can also get grant money, so that's money that you never have to pay back. Um, it could go um, directly to you know, parent loans, student loans, parent grants, all of that. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. And work study, great, work study. Work study is a form of a loan, so essentially they will allot a certain amount of money that you can earn to apply to your bill if you would like to. But if you don't get a job while you're on campus, a work study designated job, then you forfeit that amount of money. So let's say your package is 20 grand, 5,000 of that is work study. In order to earn that $5,000, you have to get a job on campus that's designated as a work study position. Another thing to keep in mind in terms of financial aid is that what UMass is gonna give you for financial aid might be very different than what Worcester State gives you and very different from what WPI gives you. So don't assume just because UMass gave you a $10,000 scholarship or grant doesn't necessarily mean that's going to apply to all colleges. So just be very careful of that. Um, also, don't be afraid to apply to colleges that might seem expensive or out of your budget range because you never know what type of uh, financial aid or merit scholarships you can get. Um, so again, that's, that's about keeping your, you know, your folders in line and as those accept letters come in, which I'm sure you'll get many of them, um, you'll also be receiving financial aid award letters. And um, again, you'll have to you know, sit down at the, the family table and talk about, okay, which school gave us this, which school gave us that, um, and kind of compare and see what your family can afford um, in terms of going to college. I just want to add that some universities, many private universities, will require a second, more invasive financial form called the College Scholarship Service Profile Form. This is not required by all universities. It's by some universities, it is an additional hoop that you will need to jump through. Um, the FAFSA looks very much about headcount in your family and overall income. The College Scholarship Service Profile Form is going to ask you about additional income that you might have through rental properties, additional assets that you might have. It is a more invasive form, and again, you will see that when you know which colleges you're applying to, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. The FAFSA application opens up in October, and then you have until March 1st to complete the FAFSA. Um, if you wait until after the deadline, you can still be looked at for package, but you will, the package that you receive will 
be significantly less than what you would have been able to get if you were within the deadline. And the sooner you apply, the better. So definitely get all of that information out. Have you guys all started the FAFSA? Anyone? You, you guys are all juniors? Oh, okay. So, so once you start senior year, that first couple semesters, you're starting in September, start thinking about that FAFSA because that's going to open up as soon as October 1st comes around. So now is the time that we can talk about our specific universities and the differences that we have. Um, so for UMass Amherst, I'll just give you a little overview. We have 22,000 undergrads. So we're uh, uh, one of the larger schools in this area. And we have over 110 majors. So we are looking at the different school, different majors very differently. Um, we break up our majors into schools and colleges. So we have, for example, the College of Natural Science. And within the College of Natural Sciences, that's where you're going to find biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. And then the College of Humanities and Fine Arts, et cetera. So um, there's 10 of those. Among those 10, we have specific schools and colleges that are more competitive than others. Those are the College of Nursing, the College of Engineering, College of Computer Science, and our Eisenberg School of Management. So what that means is when we are looking at students' transcripts and we're looking at um, GPAs and SATs, students who are applying into those specific schools are going to have to have higher GPA and SAT scores um, than students who are not applying into those specific competitive areas. Um, anyone here interested in nursing? <coughs> Engineering? Mm -hmm. Computer science? Okay, great. No nursing? Huh? Okay, I'm going to talk about nursing anyway because I just feel like it's information that you need to know. Um, oh, yes, great. There might be people watching who are interested in nursing. Um, for so these are our competitive programs. Um, so for the for our GPA SAT um, averages for the University of Massachusetts, average means that it's the middle 50%, right? Our our middle 50% range um, is about a 3.7 to a 3.9 weighted. So that's on a 5.0 scale. That means that 25% of the students admitted have lower than a 3.7, and 25% of the students admit have a higher than a, a 3.9. So that is not the minimum requirement for um, admission means that a lot of the students that are, are coming in have that range. That range that I just mentioned kind of becomes the minimums for these competitive majors. So if you're looking into applying into engineering, computer science, business, or nursing at, um, at UMass Amherst, we want to see you have closer to that 3.7 minimum. It's not a hard and fast number. It's not as though I'm going to look at your transcript and say, oh, you have a 3.7, you're in. You have a 3.7, you're out, or you don't. Um, but it is kind of a threshold area that we're looking at. Um, and then the same thing applies for standardized test scores. So for the University of Massachusetts, our middle 50% range is a 1280 to a 1320. So 25% of our students have lower than that. 25% of our students have higher than the 1320. And that becomes closer to the minimums for our competitive majors. Nursing is um, a special major at usually all the schools because their requirements are a little bit different and they're competitive and they typically don't have transfer opportunities. So for UMass Amherst, I said we have 22,000 undergraduate students. Our incoming class has about 5,000 students, and our nursing class has 64 students. Right. So that is part of the reason why uh, it's so competitive. It's due to space. And so we have to really start getting picky about who are going to be the students that we put into that cohort. Um, and so i just like to give a disclaimer to students who are applying to UMass for nursing, um, is that when a student applies to any major, they have the option of putting first choice and second choice major. And if a student is not admissible to a first choice, we will consider them for a second choice. That option kind of goes away when you're applying into nursing at UMass. So if you apply into nursing and you don't get into nursing, we don't review you at all for your second choice. We just don't admit you. However, there is a caveat. If you communicate with us and let us know that you would like to be considered for your second choice, we will do that. So you're probably wondering, like, why the extra step? Just review me for my second choice. The reason we don't do that is because there's no internal transfer option for nursing at UMass. So if you started off as a biology student, right, I couldn't put you in nursing, but I admitted you into biology, and you came to UMass Amherst with the hopes of doing an internal transfer later on into nursing, you wouldn't have that option. And so if you found that that didn't work for you because your goal was to be a nurse 
and you got into other schools that accepted you directly into nursing, you may decide to leave UMass Amherst and go to that school. But at that point, it will also be too late because most schools don't allow external transfer. So any current UMass student who's any major cannot become a nursing major now. So if you decided to come to UMass thinking you could transfer and you can't, and then you say, well, I'm just gonna go to this school that did accept me, they're gonna say, it's too late. You already enrolled at UMass Amherst. You can't come here either. And now I've just set you back four years to becoming a nurse. So we don't wanna prevent, we don't want that to happen. However, we also know that there are a lot of students who are applying into nursing because they're open to the medical field, would be willing to consider public health or willing to consider um, pre-med and didn't know that that was our rule um, and really wish that we had given them an opportunity to come in a different major. If, that, if you're that student, then as long as you send us an email, something in writing that says, hey Jasmine, if I'm not admitted into nursing, can you please review me for second choice? Then I'll make sure to do that and I'll put it in your file and we'll have some record in case you try to transfer later. So that's just our spiel about nursing. For any other of our majors, you can, trans you can move around, transfer from one major to another. For the competitive majors that I mentioned earlier, engineering, computer science, and Eisenberg, I always encourage students to apply into a competitive major as a first choice, and then select something outside of that competitive school as a second choice. Um, I read for the College of Engineering at UMass, so if anyone's interested in asking questions specifically about that, I can answer it after. Um, I often find time, uh, I often see that students will apply first choice mechanical engineering and second choice electrical engineering. And essentially, I'm reviewing you for the College of Engineering, and so if I can't admit you into mechanical, I also cannot admit you into electrical. And so then what happens is you are a fantastic student, you just didn't make the cut for engineering, but I can't just pick a different major for you, so I have to deny you admission. And you think, I'm, I could have gotten into UMass Amherst. What happened? And that's what happened. So if you're thinking a competitive major, kind of just look to our, our list of what else we have to offer. Physics may be a great option for a second choice for an engineering student, or chemistry if you're looking at chemical engineering, or biology if you're looking at biomedical engineering, and so on. Um, and so when you're going around asking different schools about what their competitive majors are, just kind of keep that as, a, add that to your list of many things that you want to keep note of. And say, all right, if I'm applying to this specific school, where else can I do just to get my foot in the door? Because a lot of times students will start off in their second choice major and then transfer in later. And the process tends to be a little bit easier in the sense that we're not considering your high school academic anymore. We're not looking at your SAT scores. They're gonna say, what did you do your first semester or your first year here at UMass? And then make their decision for an internal transfer that way. So that's kind of just the specifics about our competitive majors. And I'll pass it on to my colleague. Um, so I'm representing the great college of uh, Worcester State University. Um, to give you just a, a few quick facts about Worcester State, uh, we're a lot smaller than uh, UMass, but we are still a state institution, a little over 5,000 um, undergraduate students. Um, our most popular majors being criminal justice, education, psychology, biology, and business, but we have over 60 programs that we offer. Um, in terms of the type of student we're looking for, our average accepted student is about a B to B plus. That's about your 3.0 to 3.2, but that is an average. If you know what an average is, we do have students who are above that and some who are a little bit below. Um, our range being anywhere from a 2.6 through a 4.0 uh, GPA. We also have a nursing program, um, very similar to the expectations and criteria at UMass uh, students to be considered for nursing, do have to have a 3.5 GPA or better to be considered, and a minimum of an 1130 on the SAT. Uh, that, that is a requirement, the SAT for the nursing program. Um, all other majors, it, you have the option to go test optional. Um, a program that um, was not mentioned at uh, UMass, I don't think you have, we, at Worcester State we have occupational therapy. Uh, we have a five-year program where you can get your undergraduate degree and your graduate degree within a five-year track. I think we're one of the few in the state, maybe the only one in the state in the area. Um, a wonderful program there. Uh, again, those do have specific GPA and SAT requirements. 
you need a minimum of about a 3.2 for the OT program and a minimum of a 1080 on the SAT to be considered for that. Um, at Worcester State, if you are not admissible to nursing or OT, we will automatically review you for admission to Worcester State to a different major. So it's a matter of just reading those admissions letters very carefully because you could get a letter that says, congratulations, you've been accepted to the occupational therapy program. Or you could get a letter saying, unfortunately, you did not gain admissions to OT. However, you can come to Worcester State under a different major. Um, but knowing that those programs, you cannot internally transfer into them later. So it's either you have been accepted or not. Um, I want to also mention that Worcester State does have a summer bridge program called the Alternative for Individual Development. Some of you may, have, may or may not have heard of this program. Uh, this is a program for students who might not meet admissions criteria, the academic criteria, whether it's GPA or SAT scores, however, show academic promise or academic potential where you would do a six-week residential program, um, taking classes, meeting other students, getting tutoring services um, as a way to prepare you for college. On the Worcester State application, there is a question that will ask you if you do want to be considered for the Alternative um, for Individual Development program. It's the AID program. Uh, you could check that off, and we can consider you for that program. Um, Again, any th information that we give, if you forget or have additional questions, we will be here after and we will be taking questions. But I wanted to make you aware of the um, AID program that we have. Um, another thing that I will talk about is that all of our institutions here have great relationships with community colleges in the area. So if you find yourself, um, whether for financial reasons, you want to start at a community college, or for academic reasons, maybe you didn't meet admissions criteria at, at any of these institutions, you can start at a community college. Uh, sometimes students will do a year, maybe get their associate's degree, and all of us do have programs where you can transfer into to our universities, and we will make the admissions decision primarily on your college uh, performance meaning that we don't care about your SAT scores or your high school GPA. We are only looking at your performances at the, the college that you, that you went to. So think about transferring could be an option for you. Um, I wanted to, to, to make that point. Many, oh, yeah, so <laughs> Worcester State, we, we also have an honors program. And I think all of our institutions here do have an honors program. Think of it, at, in high school, you have the National Honor Society. You're taking honors courses. You're taking a more challenging curriculum. You're among students that are interested in, in honors courses. So all, most college and universities do have an honors program. Um, we have one where you do need a minimum of a 3.5 high school GPA to be considered for the honors program. The benefits of being part of an honors program is you can graduate with distinction on your diploma. You might have access to living learning communities where you can live with other honors students. There's a lot of social programming and community service done within honors programs. I know at Worcester State, we also have an honors scholarship to, not for admission, but we have a, an, a scholarship for current honors students to study abroad as well. Um, so you get a, a stipend actually to, to do that. So it is a wonderful program to get involved with. And so if you are in the Honor Society in high school, you might want to consider that uh, in college as well. So I'll leave that in. Uh, WPI does not have um, individualized requirements by major. So when you apply to WPI, you apply to the university. And we really don't pay too much attention to your major because you're 18 and you're probably going to change your mind anyway. So. Uh, we look at you at your standards for the university, knowing that the vast majority of our majors are in the STEM disciplines. We sort of use that lens when we're evaluating your candidacy. Um, in terms of some unusual programs or maybe some um, programs you're not familiar with, WPI has uh, strong programs, obviously, in the engineering, math, sciences. Robotics engineering is a wonderfully interdisciplinary program. We have programs in interactive media and game development, bioinformatics and computational biology. 
um, psychological sciences, architectural engineering. We have some really uh, interesting and innovative programs. Um, in terms of our average student profile, again, we don't have any differential standards. We are a test optional institution. The vast majority of our applicants um, do want to take the SAT, amazing as that is. Um, we only have about 15% of our applicant pool choosing not to submit testing. The average testing at WPI middle 50% is between a mid-1300 and a mid-1400. Average student has a 3.8 weighted GPA. They're very, very good students. They typically are taking honors and AP courses. Um, and I would say the hallmarks of a WPI education are, are hands-on, project-based curriculum. You have a series of experiences where you're actually doing what you're learning in the classroom. Uh, a mix of sort of that theory and practice are sort of the hallmark of a WPI education, which translates very, very well into the workplace. Very strong return on investment. Average starting salary of more than $68,000. So we're very proud of our graduates, but no separate standards for admission. Your counselor asked me to mention our Commonwealth Honors College, and I forgot, but I have a note right here, so I'm going to mention it before. Um, so among the 10 schools and colleges that I uh, mentioned, um, one of those is our Commonwealth Honors College. And so that's an umbrella um, system where any student of any major can be part of that college. But they do have a separate section, a separate residential area, um, special designated courses for students. Because we're a research institution, we receive a lot of funding to support research. So if you're interested in doing any type of research, um, we have lots of funding to help you and give you scholarships to support that. But through our Commonwealth Honors College, our classes are capped at 25. So of those 22,000 undergrad, you may find classes that have lecture halls with lots and lots of students. Um, but if you're really thinking you would prefer a smaller class size, the honors program is a great way to have that smaller class environment. And a lot of opportunities to conduct research with a professor um, to supplement their research or to submit your own proposals and have a professor work with you on your own. Um, so every student who is admitted into the program um, is reviewed at the time of application and you're given an invitation into the Commonwealth Honors Program, which you have the option of accepting or declining. So there's no additional application for you to fill out to tell us that you want to apply into Commonwealth Honors. If you want to indicate it somewhere on the additional information or anywhere on your application, that's fine. But you don't have to take that extra step to apply. If you're applying to UMass, you're applying to Honors. And if we feel you meet that profile, then we will offer it to you. And then if you don't get that offer at the time of admission, you can apply into Commonwealth Honors during your four years at UMass. And again, all of that high school criteria goes away, and we just want to see what you did at UMass. So that's that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, before we take questions, I did want, uh, I have a current uh, AVID senior that I just wanted to ask him if he has any advice for the students and the parents here. Um, I know he did a lot of work on his own, both with the college admissions uh, applications and also in financial aid. And this is Jose. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm a senior year at Doherty, four year average student, as you heard. And um, coming into the summer, uh, into my senior year, I, well, everybody kept talking about the college, pro college process, how easy it was for them and everything. But, um, like, this one senior year comes, it wasn't as easy as I thought, unless you have um, everything organized. Like, my avid teacher recommended me to have just a um, milk crate and organized folders, just um, keep scholarship with scholarships, have um, all your supplement essays ready, set to go. Um, and um, yeah, um, finalize a nice, uh, well-written uh, resume. So you can just um, send it in with your college application. And um, so like for me, um, some of my struggles were like, I'm a procrastinator. So that wasn't, that wasn't so good for me. Um, if you're a procrastinator, you got to keep up with the deadlines. If you don't, um, for some scholarships, um, they'll cut it off right there. They won't give you no more time. Um, I don't know about colleges, if they, you can contact them before, contact your admission officer to see if you can send in a late application. 
um, but luckily uh, uh, I've been fighting through that struggle and sending everything on time and um, now uh, I'm going to Worcester State. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it's uh, dealing with academics in high school and um, through the college process at the same time isn't as easy as, I think, uh, as everybody thinks. But like uh, with your parents by your side, um, you can manage it. It's okay. Uh, it's doable. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like a dual enrollment. There's pretty fun mistakes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. That's so far. Uh, that's how far I am in the college process right now. <laughs> well, if any of the students have any questions afterwards, I'll be here, sticking around. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I. Did, um, did want to mention um, the Naviant student online program is wonderful because we can send electronically. It connects um, all our juniors. We were with them in December when we gave their SAT scores. We also got onto their Naviant student accounts and they started the process of looking up colleges, putting in their criteria maybe what majors they wanted, um, if they wanted to be in Massachusetts or New England or in California, and you can start building the list and then you add your schools on that list. So that's the way we can manage, um, we, the students can manage this process. There's, um, there'll be matching in the beginning of the fall. <clears throat> we have uh, lots of directions and, and help with them to uh, match to the Common App and Naviance so that when they put things on Common App, it gets connected to Naviance. And that's the way uh, they would ask their teachers for letters of recommendation. They would ask them personally, verbally, beforehand, and then they send, then they input their information. And we send out our, um, we have our letters and, um, and then everything gets sent to the colleges. So it's direct, there's no more paper. Uh, the exception is Quinn Sigma Community College. Some of the community colleges still, we send it out paper. But um, otherwise, most of the colleges are connected on the Naviance um, program. So that's a great way to organize themselves, to see where they're, what they're interested in, then you can transfer that over to applied and then, um, and then on that, you can go right to their websites to see what they require for that. Um, and as far as I know, a deadline is a deadline for both admissions and for financial aid. So if you're one minute less than when the deadline is, they will not accept it. So it might be different in high school where your teachers will let you have an extended deadline. The only exception is, is when we had the ice storm and they knew that you weren't in school and a lot of the colleges did give us deadlines but scholarships, admissions and financial aid, there are deadlines. Uh, just a reminder, April vacation is a great time to visit colleges. Uh, we usually have good weather during then. Oh, it, it fills up very quickly for April vacation so this week go online and sign up. But it really does make a difference when you're on campus. You get the, the student, especially the student, and April vacation is probably the be better time than even the summer because you'll see the students in classes. So you get a real idea of what it's like on that campus, what the students are like, if you can feel like, wow, I could really feel like I'm, I'm here. A couple of things that um, I just want to point out, May 16th at Assumption College, they have a college fair. Um, all these schools will have representatives there. They usually have over 300 schools. That's a, it's really close, it's right here in Assumption. There are other uh, national ones in um, Boston and Springfield and um, in Providence. Uh, and they may have even more colleges, and you can go online and see when, when those are. But um, if you go, go and go with um, 
questions, specific questions, and they can um, ask you. A lot of times, some students will even bring their transcripts and say, you know, what do you think with my GPA? Uh, so that's a great way to um, get to see more schools and ask admissions people about their special programs, about their housing. Do they have housing guaranteed for freshmen? That's, that's a, a good question. Um, and uh, so definitely go to that um, and check out our um, website. You just go to the Doherty, and then on the right there's guidance. Click on that, and there's a whole bunch of different options you have. We have course selection. We have um, each grade has information. This is a good place. Uh, we post scholarships. We post uh, job opportunities, learning opportunities. And please make sure um, if you didn't get an email about this event, then um, please after come and give me your email address because, um, and students, check your student email because that's the way I get information out about events, about scholarships, um, really good information. Um, the financial, we do have a financial aid night. It will be in October. I haven't lined up. Um, we have an excellent speaker. I'm waiting to hear back on what night, but we usually do it the third week in October. And it, it's right, it used to be January 1st that started the financial aid. Now it's October 1st. And so, um, and you can use to that the year before that tax information, but you'll get really good information from um, Dwayne Quinn. You know Dwayne, oh, yeah. Jennifer, yep. Yep, he's been in, in, the, in, yeah, in the business for th over probably 30 years now. Any other lasting advice from our admissions experts? Oh, hi. I'll just reiterate what Tiana said in the beginning. It's going to be okay. This is probably a lot of information to digest. You're probably like, I don't remember anything. You're going to rewatch this video a few times. It's okay. Um, don't worry about what major you have because you might change your mind a bunch of times. Don't let this be stressful. You have a lot of resources to help you. And we are resources as well. So even if you're not applying to UMass Amherst, I'm leaving my card. Feel free to email me or call and ask questions just about the general process. That's what we're here for. We don't want you to be stressed out. It's already daunting enough. So please use us. And um, during open houses, all of our institutions have open houses. That's a great time to actually meet faculty within those different departments. Because as admissions counselors, we have general information about all the majors. But if you really want some in-depth information about business or visual performing arts, I highly recommend coming to an open house and actually speaking to the faculty within that department. Because they can give you a better, much more information than maybe we can as well. Um, I do, not off the top of my head. Our open houses are in the fall. Um, they are in October, November. I want to say it might be the 14th of October, but don't quote me. Um, our websites as well um, have a complete list of all of our visit options. And you can sign up online to do a tour, do an open house. Um, we even have accepted students programs, which I hope maybe Jose you'll come to. Um, so as you're getting your acceptances, there, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to visit throughout the year. Um, I know all of us, I think, even have summer tours. So if you wanted to get, take a tour during the summertime. So you'd go on to our institutional website, look for admissions, look for a visit, and you can actually see the, the schedule and sign up that way. Did you want to add anything, Jennifer? I was just going to say my, my piece of advice is to the students, this is a journey of self-discovery. You're going to learn a lot about yourself, about what you really want out of life. Um, so I think, I do, I really believe that. Tiana's making fun of me. I just think that you really do, you think about what you really want out of the next step, out of your future, and it takes some self-reflection, but it really is um, a really, and for parents, you end up spending a lot of time in the car with your son or daughter traipsing to campuses. So take the opportunity to get to know them in a different way, and again, wherever you land, you are all amazing people, going to do great things. So I wish you the best of luck, but enjoy the journey. And if I can just say something, the students that do spend time, even more time on their safety schools, finding 
and that could be academic safety and financial safety, the better that we don't see them transferring, you know, a year later that they're transferring to other schools. So spending the time now and over the summer really, um, and self-reflection is important. Do I want to be in a large school? So that's why even these three schools, if you visited just these three schools, you'd have a chance to really experience what a very large uh, university is, what a private university, and then a smaller university. Um, one, you know, UMass isn't in, a, well, it's a city of its own, but um, a, a town, you are a town, a town. It seems like, it seems like a city, but, um, but it's more rural than being in a city. And so um, we're fortunate, just even in Massachusetts, within an hour, you can go and see different, and even just in Worcester, you could see different schools, just the different types, just so that you know what, what you're looking at. If Do you wanna be in a classroom size with 250 students or with 30 students and asking them those questions, how many typically are in there. Thank you very much for coming tonight and you can uh, go to our website for more information. Thank you.